Hello and welcome. On behalf of the Saskatoon Industry Education Council, I welcome you to our Career Pathways panel. I want to thank RBC Future Launch for helping to power our Spotlight on Careers event. We acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Welcome to students, parents, and teachers from across Saskatchewan who are joining us today. As a registered nonprofit organization, the SIEC works in partnership with three school divisions and the Saskatoon Tribal Council, as well as community-based organizations, government agencies, and employers to help nurture the workforce of tomorrow. Last year, the SIEC worked with over 30,000 youth, over 3,300 business and post-secondary representatives, and more than 450 educators and career practitioners. The SIEC hosts over 40 events and programs every year, including our skills boot camps, which provide students with hands-on experience in various careers. Our Spotlight on Careers, which is a series of targeted events that provide students with experiential learning opportunities. Connected, our Women Mentorship Program connecting females in grades 10 to 12 with mentors from a wide variety of sectors in Saskatoon as well as our Summer Youth Internship Program, which is a six-week paid internship where students gain work experience in construction, manufacturing, automotive, and culinary industries, as well as earning competitive wages and high school credits. So for more information, please visit our website, saskatooniec.ca, or follow us on our socials to stay updated on our program offerings. And if you're not sure what you want to do after high school, we highly recommend attending a few of our events to discover what is involved in various career options. I want to take this opportunity to thank our panelists who are joining us today and sharing their stories with you. And I want to encourage everyone who is tuning in to utilize the Q&A function to enter any questions you may have. And your question may be a general question for all of the panelists, or if you have a question for one um, panelist in particular, please specify who that question is for, and we will look to answer those throughout our event. So we are going to get started. And our first speaker with us today is Ellen Redlick. She is the Academic Programs and Outreach Coordinator for the Department of Computer Science at the U of S. She received her Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at USAC in 2010. She then worked as a developer on HRIS software for six years before returning to USAC to get her Master's in Computer Science. She currently sits on the advisory board for the CoLearn program at CoLab. And outside of work, you can find Ellen curling or on the golf course. She has been an active volunteer in the curling community in recent years, including being the president of the best club in the city, the Nutana Curling Club. So please welcome Ellen. Thanks, Michelle. Just gonna share my screen and we can get started. Um, so my presentation is gonna be a little bit different. I am here to talk about the programs that we offer in the Department of Computer Science. And then when the panelists talk about their career journeys, hopefully some of them may line up um, with the programs that we offer and you can see kind of the link between things there. So the department um, offers two degree programs. First off is our traditional computer science degree, which is a comprehensive degree program um, that will give you the widest knowledge of computer science and the most opportunity to branch out into different areas of the field. Secondly is Applied Computing, which is a brand new program launching in May, and it is basically the application of computer science to different areas, and I'm really excited to introduce this program to you today. As I said, our computer science degree is a traditional program in computer science. It provides a solid foundation for computer science theories, techniques, and prepares you for a broad range of careers related to software development, IT, and grad studies or research, if that's what you're interested in pursuing. For the first two years, you'll gain a really solid basis of computer science. And then on your last two years, you'll take classes that get more specialized into topics of interest, such as artificial intelligence, image processing, human computer interaction, game development, web programming. Those are all a few examples of some of the things that in the last two years, you'll have a little more wiggle room in deciding what you're interested in and choosing those classes that best match your interests. Most students will do a four-year or four-year honors degree, but we do also offer three-year degree, a minor, or a certificate as well. 
And students can choose the software engineering option if um, they're interested in specializing in the field of software engineering. Some students also choose to do a second degree program where they essentially complete the requirements from two majors. And a common example of this would be doing an electrical engineering and computer science degrees kind of together. Um, so there's lots of options with the computer science degree as you can probably tell. The applied computing program is brand new and launching in May, 2022. It's an interdisciplinary program that provides knowledge in computer science and another area of application. So there are currently five areas or concentrations of applied computing that we're gonna be offering when the program launches in May. Um, two of these concentrations were already in existence in our department and they have been reclassified under the umbrella of applied computing. And the other three are brand new to the department starting in this upcoming spring. This program really arose out of the understanding that as technology permeates through every area of our lives, there are now just more industries and jobs than ever that need technical expertise. And having people who understand computer science and also know about the original domain is just gonna be so important moving forward. So in the applied computing program, students still get that great foundation of computer science skills and will take many of the same courses as a computer science student would, but they're also taking this package of courses from other disciplines that provide them with the knowledge in their chosen concentration. Um, I think that this program is really going to pique the interest of people who may not have really considered a computer science degree in the past. Just being able to specialize into these different areas and bridge the gaps between programs is a really unique opportunity. And I think it will open the door to a lot of new students in our department. This degree program is only offered as a four-year or four-year honors degree. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is that students in both our applied computing program and the computer science program will have the opportunity to join our internship program to get paid hands-on work experience in the industry before they graduate. So now I just want to dive a little bit into each of the applied computing concentrations. Bioinformatics is one of the concentrations that was already in existence in the program in the department. Um, it is the meeting point of computer science and molecular biology. So if you take this program, along with the core computer science foundations, you'd be taking courses in biology, chemistry, math, and stats. The field has grown a lot in recent years thanks to genome sequencing, and the volume of data that is created by this sequencing is just so enormous that special computation techniques and tools are needed for storing, visualizing, and analyzing all of it. And that's the role of a bioinformatician. Bioinformatics has contributed to solving problems such as developing the COVID-19 vaccines or breeding new crop varieties. So thinking of agriculture and health, those are some of the areas that you may be working in if you go into bioinformatics. The business concentration combines courses in computer science and commerce from the Edwards School of Business um, to provide students with knowledge in fundamentals of computer science and programming, um, software development, as well as fundamentals of business and marketing. And this combination is going to produce graduates with the programming and data analysis skills that traditional businesses are looking for. And it's also going to create great client facing employees at tech companies who can speak the language of technology and interact with clients in a meaningful way. So whether you choose to take that step into a traditional business and be the person with the technical skills or be the person at the tech shop with the business skills, you can choose which way you want your career to go with this concentration. Data analytics combines courses in computer science and math and stats to teach students the fundamentals of computer science, data analysis, mathematical modeling, and machine learning. Um, this program will give you strong skills in data analytics to allow you to go into any field and learn the domain knowledge needed to create meaningful results in that field. The role of a data analyst is to be able to take raw data and turn it into useful trends and insights. And these roles are highly sought after now. I'm sure you've all heard of the phrase, you know, data scientist, data analyst. Um, everyone is seeing the potential value of data. And this is a role, role that helps companies capitalize on this data. Um, next up, Geomatics combines courses from computer science and geography. This program um, contains classes in data analytics, data visualization, image processing, and GIS, or geographic information systems. So here you'll be learning how to analyze and interpret spatial data using satellite or drone images or GPS data. 
Um, examples of some of the things that you may be doing in geomatics would be investigating satellite imagery of crops, analyzing check-in data from social networks, or looking for hospital records um, tracking a contagious disease. So there's a lot of widespread applications here, but anything that deals with analyzing and interpreting spatial data is possible in that field. And finally, interactive systems design combines courses in art and art history, with psychology and computer science. So this program is all about how people will use and interact with systems and how to design them properly. So this helps build effective and user-friendly interfaces for things like the apps you use on your phone, the websites you visit every day, and the games that you play. So if this information has excited you and you're curious about how to apply, admission is through the College of Arts and Science. Um, this is an excerpt of a PDF that they have on the admissions website with all the prereqs that you should be taking in high school if you want to join in on any of these disciplines. Just a note um, that if you do have the ability to take CS30 in high school, that's definitely going to give you a head start in our program, but it's not required. So don't worry too much if your school doesn't offer it. We do have a course called CMPT 140. It's an introductory course um, and it gives a lot of the same information, gives you the same head start as if you didn't um, or if you did have access um, to CS30 in high school. So that's everything I have for you today. I hope this was helpful for you. If you're still considering what your career path may look like, or if maybe you knew you were already interested in tech, but you wanted to learn a little bit more of how you can get your foot in the door with your education. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle. All right, well, thank you so much, Ellen, for sharing that information with us. And if anyone does have questions for Ellen, make sure that you put it in the Q&A and we will look to address those later on in our, our event. So next up, we are going to hear from Dr. Aaron Janay. He is a former professional musician who retired after 10 years of performing across North America to get a Bachelor of Science and PhD in Computer Science from the University of Saskatchewan. In 2012, Aaron took a job at Solido Design Automation, a startup in the semiconductor software industry in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. There, he worked as an applications engineer and eventually managed the operations of the technical sales team supporting the growing existing customers in the role of director of customer experience. In 2017, Solido was acquired by Siemens AG, the large German multinational, and the Saskatoon site expanded from the 14 employees at Aaron's arrival to over 160 in 2021. At Siemens, Aaron has two roles. He manages a large team of applications engineers doing technical sales work, and he is appointed to the Siemens government affairs team. Dr. Janay represents Siemens as president of SAS Tech, an industry advisory organization to government and educational stakeholders. Dr. Janay is deeply involved in the University of Saskatchewan, sitting on the Dean's Advisory Committee in Engineering as an appointee to the Intellectual Property Working Group to the Office of the Vice President of Research, and as a member of the Signature Area's Steering Committee. He works closely with the University of Regina and Saskatchewan Polytechnic, in addition to various government ministries in Saskatchewan and federally. So please welcome Dr. Aaron Janay. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, boys, that makes me sound more important than I am. Um, it's nice to, to meet all of you. Um, I, yeah, I'm a, a former musician who uh, accidentally ended up in technology. Um, and Ellen's presentation that she just gave you um, uh, is, is some of the stuff that I actually work on with uh, universities and trying to develop things like that applied computing program. We've had a, a lot of conversations about what that should look like and, and uh, uh, worked with industry stakeholders at companies like mine too to get it to the point where it is an excellent stepping stone into a career in technology or innovation um, without necessarily having to be a software developer, which lots of people don't wanna be. Um, so uh, my instructions are to tell you a little bit about how I got here. Um, a little bit of my thunder was stolen, I guess, because that, that bio is a little um, specific. 
but yes, I sang with an a cappella boy band for 10 years, which was a very funny job and fun. Uh, but it uh, was long hours and I was away on the road a lot. And so when I um, got to the point where I wanted to get married, I realized I didn't need to be here in Saskatoon. And I tried to get into the College of Commerce to take a business degree since I'd been running a business as a musician for 10 years. Um, but I dropped out of school to go and, and sing in a band. So my marks weren't good enough for me to be able to continue uh, and, and get into um, College of Commerce. So I got into the College of Arts and Science with what I had and uh, started from ground zero uh, with a bachelor's in computer science, um, which it turned out that I really liked. And over the years that turned into a, a master's which got flipped into a PhD, which is a, a way of just kind of skipping a degree, I guess. Um, it makes your PhD longer, but um, nonetheless, it, 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 it gets you through. And uh, as I was finishing that up, I saw, I put together a LinkedIn profile and saw one of my old childhood friends uh, scrolling through it and said, oh, hey, are you looking for somebody um, at your company? And he said, yeah, actually we are. Why don't you come down and have an interview? And so I did interview, not, not just with him, um, which would have been a little bit incestuous, but um, with uh, uh, a few other people. And I got a job um, in a field I knew nothing about. Uh, which is actually ten, what tends to happen. Um, you go to school in something and you take a, a degree and you specialize and understand a lot about you know, web development or a lot about, in my case, human computer interaction. Um, and then you end up in a job in a totally different field. Maybe you end up in mining automation or uh, in uh, energy transition or <laughs> in ag, ag tech or something. I ended up in the semiconductor industry. Um, so this was a small startup called Salido. And uh, I, we build software for people who design computer chips. So if you have a, a phone in your hand or nearby, um, every single chip in that phone uh, was built using the software that Salido, this, this little company I joined, um, um, makes. Um, and obviously we were doing well as uh, we became a very important part of how people designed and verified computer chips. And a few years later, after I joined, we got acquired by Siemens, um, which is, I don't know, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's going from being part of one of the smallest organizations possible, which is, you know, a startup, uh, to one of the one of the largest companies in the world. It's, it's right up there. It's, it's in the top 20 of, of most uh, revenue. Um, and it is the largest software company in the world. It's bigger than Google. It's bigger than Facebook. Um, it's bigger than Apple. Um, we sell to all of those companies. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, suddenly it was a very small cog in a very large organization, um, but a successful one. Our, our uh, in the Saskatoon site is, is a really good one. Um, and we have great people working here and we build software that's very successful. And so the result is that we've continued to grow. Um, so we're based at Innovation Place in Saskatoon. And um, we have about three quarters of a floor of one of the buildings and we're just building out the second half of that or another floor uh, with an identical build out right now. Uh, because we don't have enough room for everybody who wants to come into the office, uh, to have them in the office. Um, somewhere along the lines, I ended up talking a lot about what the industry needs for labor. So um, there are uh, kind of a small number of people in the province who have a really good sense for what the technology and innovation sector needs uh, in terms of employees, what kinds of skills you need, um, where the specific demands are, how we can get um, those people into companies, uh, how we can find more of those people. Um, and I'm privileged to be a part of that community. And we just spend a lot of time talking to government, which might not sound that exciting. Uh, a lot of time spending talking to um, universities, which is uh, only moderately more exciting than talking to government. And uh, a lot of time talking to uh, K-12 stakeholders, uh, so people who are trying to build curriculum that's relevant to uh, uh, kids who are in kindergarten to grade 12. And in the process, um, we try to create a bit of an ecosystem in the province. And it's working. You know, seven or eight years ago, 
before I started this and um, we had a, a very small community. There were maybe four or five companies with more than 30 people in it in the, in the province actually, um, in terms of, of uh, being tech, pure play technology companies. And now there's over 20 of them. And there's certainly a lot in the, in the mid range there in, in that uh, 10 to 30 range. Um, that means that there are more opportunities for people coming out of school. It also means that our problem of labor is, is much more difficult. Um, but the good news, I think, there in terms of where, from where my experience comes, is that the, um, you don't have to have a straight line to get a job that's good in the sector. You can do something else for a while. Um, you can come from another industry and decide that you want to be involved in the innovation industry. Um, you can uh, make mistakes and come back. I, I did lots of those. And, um, and, and still there's, there's room for you. And really at its core, that's why the applied computing program is in place is, is because it's recognizing that we don't need people who just, well, I mean, we do, but we don't just need people who are software developers and computer scientists. We need people who have a broad spectrum of experiences that they can bring to their employment. And uh, that includes uh, business and that includes bioinformatics and that includes um, uh, uh, geographical information systems. Um, that includes art and design. Um, and we're short those people in the province. It's actually the biggest problem that we have um, is that we have very, very few people with a skill set of being very good in the domain that uh, that is adjacent to innovation and the technological skills to marry that uh, domain to um, the, a digital uh, presence. And uh, we're undergoing a digital revolution in, in everywhere around the world, but especially here in Saskatchewan, um, because our primary economic sectors, mining, um, energy, agriculture are all becoming uh, technology companies. Um, Nutrien is hiring more people, more data scientists than they are miners right now. Um, and uh, that's going to only continue. Uh, and so the kinds of skills that we need are from people who are interested in technology and other things right now. And so that's what the applied computing programs are trying to get at. And that's, uh, I think, why we're going to do well as a province in, in meeting our, our needs from the labor sector. Um, so my job involves uh, all kinds of different things. Just to give you a very thumbnail sketch before I, I retire and let the other panelists speak. Um, I manage a team of, of 17 applications engineers who spend a lot of time on video conference or screen sharing uh, with people with masters and PhDs in computer engineering from around the world, uh, India, China, uh, Europe, um, uh, North America. They uh, are all uh, designed They're from companies like Apple and NVIDIA, Samsung, um, uh, companies you've recognized, also companies that you don't hear about as much, Qualcomm and Broadcom. Um, and they are all building the next generation of computer chips that are going to go into cars, into phones, into microwaves and dishwashers, into lights, um, into traffic systems, uh, into everything you can possibly imagine, into combines. Um, and uh, as they do that, they need help running our software to make sure that those chips are going to work properly. And so my team is all around me right now, and they're doing the work of making sure that they're well supported, but also because we're a software company trying to sell more software, we're finding new problems that we can solve for these people that we're helping and selling them more software as, as we solve more problems. Um, I also spend a lot of time working with the R&D team on identifying where our software isn't working very properly and prioritizing what we need to fix first and what we might be able to build next. Um, uh, and the operations of that, which is very complicated. It's not uh, when you are building software that has a million lines of code or millions of lines of code and hundreds of people working on it. Um, it's a very difficult process to make sure that you're releasing good software and you're fixing bugs in a timely fashion. Um, I spend a lot of time hiring. I have hired uh, directly 10 people in the last year and indirectly closer to 25. Um, I uh, spend a lot of time 
uh, working, as I've said, with, uh, with governments and, and post-secondary institutions. Um, and that pretty much fills my day. Uh, and no day is the same. Every day is different. And my job changes almost every six months in some very fundamental way. Uh, and that's very typical of our industry. So uh, there's no real expectation you can have getting out of school about slotting into a particular kind of job. Um, that's gonna change underneath you as technology changes and as the job market changes and your interests change. So that's me. I'm happy to answer any questions about what we do or my circuitous route to the job I'm in now uh, or anything else. And thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Janae. And if anyone does have any questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A and we will get those answered for you a little bit later on. So we are going to move on to our next panelist. Dr. Jennifer Town has been working in microbiology research since obtaining her Bachelor of Science from the University of Alberta in 2001. Working for both academic and government institutions, Dr. Town completed her PhD at the University of Saskatchewan in 2015 and has been a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon since 2020. Dr. Town uses DNA sequencing and bioinformatics extensively in her research to examine complex communities of bacteria and fungi in soil and plants. She also uses comparative genomics to identify microorganisms with plant growth promoting and biocontrol capabilities. So please welcome Dr. Jennifer Town. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to say thanks to the SIUC for inviting me today. So as Michelle mentioned, my name is Jennifer Town, and I'm a research scientist in soil microbiology at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada here on the U of S campus in Saskatoon. I have been working in microbiology research labs for about 20 years now um, as a technician and then eventually as a postdoc and now as a scientist. Um, I've worked for both government um, and academic institutions in Alberta and Saskatchewan um, on different projects, but the majority of my research is focused on uh, looking at bacteria and fungi in plants and soil. And I think when people imagine the day-to-day -day work of a microbiologist, they probably envision lots of culturing at the bench and inoculating plates and looking through microscopes. And I do do those things. But with advances in technology, um, and especially in DNA sequencing technology, bioinformatics is really central now to how a lot of research in biological sciences is accomplished. So when I did my undergraduate degree 20 years ago, bioinformatics wasn't really on my radar. Um, I think it was mostly a sub-discipline of computer sciences, and there certainly um, at the U of A wasn't a program centered around it by any means. But now, 20 years later, a large portion of what I do is focused on using bioinformatics to analyze protein and mostly DNA sequences. And to use that information to exploit the microbiome of plants um, and soil and agriculture. And it's this aspect of my research, I think, that has really changed the most over the last 20 years during my career. So in studying these complex communities, what that means is uh, usually we'll start by sequencing what we call a universal target gene from everything in the community and then comparing that to a reference database. And that lets us see what different bacteria or fungi are in the community and maybe how that community is changing under different conditions. So some of my first, first projects right after I graduated um, using this method, I would maybe generate a hundred or a thousand sequences for every sample. And the labor for that was a really big undertaking. Um, I spent, it took me a whole summer, um, a four month sort of pull up project to generate a thousand sequences for eight samples. Um, so that's four months of labor. And then when you got the data back, a lot of the da data analysis was still kind of done semi-manually. Um, there were algorithms to kind of align the sequences, but a lot of the quality control and trimming and really sort of making a table of the frequencies that you saw, different frequencies, um, a lot of that was kind of done manually. 
Um, over the next 10 years, the technology really started to take a big leap forward. Um, and by 2010, now with a lot less labor, you could generate as many as 10,000 sequences um, per sample with about 25% of the actual bench labor um, required. And this kind of sequencing um, technology development was really, I think, the inflection point in terms of relying on bioinformatics and big data analysis to really be able to analyze your samples. At that point, there was just too many sequences to really oversee manually. Um, and now, cut to today, 10 years after that, um, I just finished preparing a set of samples. We probably spent about a month, I would say, doing the processing and the preparing of the samples for sequencing. And this run is going to generate about two and a half billion DNA sequences, or about 50 million sequences per sample. So again, we're talking about a logarithmic increase in how much data we can generate. It's really changed the kind of research that we're able to do and it's the type of analysis that we, that we do. Um, now, instead of just identifying what bacteria and fungi are there, we actually have enough capacity to go deeper to sequence what we call the pan genome. So we're getting an idea of the function, what, um, what role are they playing, especially for me in agriculture, in uh, nutrient cycling in the plants in the soil. So we can, we can kind of go beyond just a, a superficial characterization. Um, these advances have also made sequencing genomes, individual genomes for bacteria and fungi a lot easier and cheaper. Uh, the first human genome was sequenced in the 1990s and it took a little over a decade and cost the estimates range anywhere from 500 million to a billion dollars. And now you can sequence a human genome for about $1,500. So, um, as the capacity has gone up, the cost per sample has gone way down. Um, that means for something like a bacteria or a fungus, uh, whose genome is much, much smaller than a human, um, it's pretty much expected now. If you have a microorganism that you're interested in, that you're publishing about, uh, maybe it has a plant growth promoting activity or it's a useful biocontrol microorganism, it's basically a given that you are going to be sequencing that strain, that bacteria, that fungi, and probably other closely related strains as well, so that you can compare their genomes and try and get an idea of, okay, well, what mechanism, what genes, what abilities make this particular bug special and um, convey that activity that you're interested in. So by the time I did my PhD in 2015 at the University of Saskatchewan, the importance of bioinformatics to my research and I would say in biological sciences in general was already really well established. So by then, um, I did actually take uh, two courses, which for my program was actually, because it was thesis-based, looked out to about 30% actually of my, the courses I had to take were in, in bioinformatics at the graduate level. Um, I would say now, as a scientist, I probably spend about 25% of my time um, either in the field or in the lab with other technicians and students, collecting samples, processing samples, working at the bench, that kind of thing. Uh, about 25% uh, writing papers and grant proposals, trying to get funding to do more research. And then about 50% of my day, I would say, is spent using different bioinformatics and big data tools um, to do to analyze some of the samples that we've already processed and sequenced. Um, with this huge increase in the amount of data that we're generating, just the data handling itself has become a lot more complicated. Um, I've also now, in the last five years, um, since my PhD, spent quite a bit of time um, investing in learning R and Python languages, which can be really helpful for um, dealing with large biological data sets uh, in particular. Um, in a lot of ways, it's really gotten to the point where um, one of the big bottlenecks in this kind of research is not our ability to generate the data, it's our ability to analyze the data. We can generate it so quickly and on such a scale that um, it's really hard to find the people and the manpower and the computational power um, to be able to analyze it in a timely manner and to analyze it thoroughly. Um, often, you know, with these large sequencing data sets, we have one or two very specific questions that you're looking for. But really, um, if we can develop more ways to more efficiently share some of these large data sets among scientists, they could be used, I think, to answer um, a whole range of, of questions that are beyond maybe what the experiment was originally intended for. 
Um, and to that end, uh, AEFC has been hiring more um, bioinformaticians in, in recent years um, and, and at all levels. So we've actually had um, undergraduate students uh, work with us in our lab, often on maybe a short-term kind of one-off project that just requires um, somebody to really invest uh, the time in looking at it. Um, and these are undergraduate students who are still, you know, um, looking through their, their bachelor's degree program. Um, we've also had uh, graduate students who have done work in our lab, both in, on the data analysis part, but then also to spend some time at the bench as well. Um, I, I, I found that um, people undergoing this program are, are often interested in and looking for both types of experiences. They want to be involved in the computer analysis side, but they also want to be involved in some of the, the wet lab biology that happens at the bench. Um, and so I think our lab is really at the intersection of being able to provide uh, both of those opportunities. And I think a lot more biology labs as well are sort of heading in that, in, in that direction. Um, and then we also have full-time bioinformaticians that work at AAFC that um, contribute to multiple projects and um, will also contribute to developing um, more tools um, as DNA technology continues to advance. Um, uh, we need more tools for looking at the data, different types of sequencing data, and also for um, interacting with and visualizing the very large data sets that, that we end up with. Um, so I think looking forward, uh, this technology is going to continue to expand. Um, and really, I think anyone who even just whose primary interest might lie in the biological sciences, um, I think if you can incorporate some aspect of, of bioinformatics into your, your program, it would, it would be a real benefit um, because um, it's becoming a real integral um, component to a lot of, of disciplines in biology. Especially with the advances in DNA sequencing technology, it's, it's, we see more recently now a lot of plant genomes being published. Um, plant genomes are really complicated. The wheat genome, for instance, I think is about five times the size of a human genome. And so it's really only with these new advances that it becomes reasonable and cost effective um, to do a lot of um, sequencing in that area. And so we're, we're seeing a lot more of it. Um, I do still kind of consider myself uh, more of a biologist, I suppose, uh, as compared to a full-time bioinformatician. Um, I would say the main main difference there is that uh, I'm still just a user of tools. Um, I would consider someone who's more of a full-time bioinformatician, also um, a developer of tools, and that's a little bit beyond um, my current skill set. But certainly, um, I find it exciting. Um, I've found that being able to incorporate um, a lot uh, and expand my bioinformatics skill set really allows me to play a more active role in the research that I do. I'm not relying on other people or other scientists to um, interpret results. And so that makes it exciting. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's exciting that um, this program is really being expanded and developed at the University of Saskatchewan. I've worked with quite a few um, students who both as undergraduates and, and graduate students um, in the U.S. programs, and we've always had um, some really successful collaborations. So, um, yeah, I think uh, going forward, um, I would I would really expect this area to expand, and um, hopefully others can find it as exciting as I do, I guess. Uh, with that, I think I'll just wrap up. Uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to continue to me, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much for sharing that information about your career path with us. You used a lot of words that I have no idea what they mean, but I'm sure any students tuning in um, probably have an interest in the tech area and in sciences. So hopefully they understood what you were talking about, but thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Cameron Johns. He is a senior product designer at Vendasta, where he currently leads product design for their vendor division. After dropping out of a visual arts degree and a brief career as an automotive mechanic, he graduated with honors from the University of Saskatchewan with a bachelor's degree in interactive systems design in 2017. 
Following graduation, Cameron worked in Saskatoon for a year before moving to Calgary. He continues to work with great Saskatchewan businesses while pursuing his career remotely. When he isn't working, he can be found playing the guitar or spending time with his golden retriever, Jaya. Cameron enjoys collecting mid-century designed furniture and vintage guitars. In his spare time, he designs and develops websites for local Saskatoon businesses, such as TCU Place, Philosophy Restaurant, Well Done Plumbing, and more. So please welcome Cameron, and if we're lucky, maybe we'll see Jaya as well. <laughs> she might uh, she might make an appearance here, but uh, you never know. Um, so yeah, so let me first start off uh, by explaining, I guess, a little bit uh, what product design is. Um, so at its core, I would say product design is really problem solving. Um, you know, a product designer will use the different principles and tools of design um, to solve a person's problem or improve their experience. Um, so people may have heard of a UX designer, uh, UI designer, an experience designer, uh, interaction designer, information architect. Um, these are all kind of different roles and responsibilities that product design actually kind of wraps up. Um, and those are all roles and responsibilities you might have as a product designer. Um, you know, product designers are not artists. Uh, we're not graphic designers. Um, you know, there is a lot of creativity in the role. Um, but a product designer is going to use science and psychology in their solutions, whereas art is a, a little up for interpretation. Um, you know, so how did I get here? Um, you know, maybe like a lot of you, maybe some of you, um, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do after I graduated high school. And it actually took me a few kind of dead end jobs uh, before I knew what I didn't want to do. Um, and this ended up being actually a really well-learned lesson as it kind of taught me what I was looking for in a future career. Um, <clears throat> and so first and foremost, I really wanted something that would challenge me. Uh, you know, I knew if it was mind numbing or boring, um, you know, I would become complacent and I would do a poor job. Um, you know, secondly, I wanted to work somewhere that would let me work from home. Uh, I've actually been working from home a lot longer than COVID. Um, ever since 2018, actually. And so I really wanted a job that would let me continue to work with a place I really felt passionate about, but while still allowing me to live my life, you know, I can move anywhere, I can go on a long vacation, I can do a working vacation, um, all of these sorts of things. So that was really important to me in a career as well. Um, and thirdly, and maybe most importantly, I wanted a career in a field or an industry that I felt was going to be future proof. Um, you know, I didn't want to be the guy getting into coal just as everyone's getting onto solar and that sort of thing. So I was really looking for something that would set me up for hopefully the, the rest of my life, uh, for sure. And so this actually led me to find the interactive systems program at the U of S. I'm a U of S graduate. Um, you know, this program was, was perfect for someone like me who really wanted to get into the tech industry, um, but I didn't have the confidence in my maths or my sciences uh, to go that engineering or that computer, you know, software development kind of route. Um, and so I was really looking for something that I could leverage the skills I have. And, you know, I, I didn't really feel good about those, uh, those particular classes. Um, I also did not have, you know, kind of similar to Dr. Ganey there, I did not have the best grades. Um, I didn't even actually have some of the necessary high school classes to even get in to the uh, ISD program at the U of S. Um, so I actually started taking the university's transition program. Um, and I actually spent my first year taking all of my classes out of the Royal West campus where the Saskatchewan Industry Education Council uh, is based out of today. So that was actually where I spent my first uh, year of, of my degree. Um, and this kind of leads me to my first tip uh, I'd love to share, which is treat school or however you get educated, treat it like a job, um, you know, show up eight to five, do quality work. Um, not only is this going to help you prepare you mentally and physically uh, when you transition to the working world, but it's also going to let you have a better balance when you're in school. You know, I found I was able to still have my evenings and weekends free by by kind of treating it like a job and you know I did my my schoolwork between eight and five and I had my evenings and my weekends to to party and, and hang out with my friends and, and do all the fun socializing that you want to do in university um so yeah I think just 
treating it like that is going to help you be successful um, as you look to to move past school as well. Um, fast forward a few years, you know, I'm in the final semester of my degree um, and I actually attended the department's uh, career fair. And I just spent my time there, you know, getting to know the different companies, getting to know the different individuals at the company and really just networking. Um, you know, I found out that a few of my classmates had actually already started working for some of these companies. Some of them even held, uh, you know, pretty prestigious positions with some of these companies already. And they were actually at the career fair and that just made it that much easier to apply. Um, you know, just made it so much more comfortable. Um, and so I actually applied, they didn't have any product design positions open. So I actually applied for an entry level marketing job as a website designer uh, with Vendasta. And I was actually lucky enough to get brought on part-time uh, while I finished up my final semester of school. And so this kind of leads me to my second point, which is really just get your foot in the door. Um, you know, you're immensely more hireable when you're employed. And oftentimes um, there's going to be way, you know, there's going to be a ton more opportunities within your company once you get in there. Um, so, you know, don't be ashamed to, to start at the bottom. You can always work yourself up to the top, you know. So if you see a company that you really want to work for uh, and they don't have any roles available to you um, at the moment or they only have lower, you know, entry level roles, don't be ashamed to just uh, get your foot in the door, uh, get started with them, because once you're in the industry, you know, in any regard, um, it's, it's worth a hell of a lot more than uh, wishing you were. So... Um, yeah, you know, after less than a year into my role, um, a product design position did open up and I was able to apply and I was able to use my ISD uh, degree and the rapport I'd built with the company to, to get the job. Um, and so I've been doing that ever since. And, uh, you know, I've been able to work myself up to a, a senior level position and now kind of setting my sights uh, on a lead uh, or director position, you know, in the coming years. Um, so a ton of opportunity for growth. Um, again, you know, just get in somewhere and, and you'll be surprised with how many more opportunities kind of open up for you. Um, a typical day uh, for product design, I'd say, usually involves meeting with stakeholders um, or members of the team, uh, conducting research, maybe interviewing users, um, mapping out user journeys, uh, it might even involve, you know, building high fidelity mockups of the different software and solutions our team looks to build, um, or it could be presenting ideas um, to the rest of the company or running tests um, with users. So it's kind of hard to lock down a typical day. There's so much that your day could be involved in, but th those are kind of the high, high level uh, tasks that my day kind of involves. Um, a big part of the job, I'd say, is communication, um, whether it be communicating an idea via a visual design, uh, maybe just talking with stakeholders, uh, working with the team, interviewing users, uh, presenting to others. You're honestly just always constantly trying to communicate the ideas in your head um, with those around you. And so that kind of leads to my third tip, I guess, which would just be work on your communication skills, um, whether it actually be for tasks related to your job or you're just speaking with coworkers or approaching your manager, uh, you know, about a raise or promotion, uh, communicating effectively is just going to help you immensely um, and can honestly be the difference maker, uh, you know, for that raise or that promotion. Um, so being able to take criticism and share your thoughts and feelings honestly and candidly, you know, regardless of industry you go into, those are just going to be skills that are going to help you um, as you kind of go through through your own career journeys. Um, and so what I love most about being a product designer is probably that it's always exciting. Um, I'm always learning something new. Um, there's so many areas and disciplines within product design. I'm never stuck doing the same thing over again. Uh, and there's no shortage of, of you know, work to, to work on or, or things to improve. Um, and honestly, pretty much any industry that has customers um, or provides any sort of experience, either has product designers or, or could benefit uh, from product designers. So, you know, whether it be ordering food, uh, paying for your gas, self-checkouts at the grocery store, uh, any number of the apps you might use on a daily basis, uh, these are all things 
um, you can bet that someone somewhere has been spending their time helping to design, helping to iron out any of the kinks. Um, and so, you know, to me, this kind of just shows the uh, security that this industry has. Um, and, you know, I think Ellen hit it best with, with those new programs popping up is that there is tech involved in anything. And so by nature, there's product des design involved in anything. And so the, you know, the security of this industry looks great for the future, the options, the career, career options and choices look great. Um, and as more and more companies kind of begin to realize the benefit of having a dedicated product designer, uh, I think the opportunities and, and the industry are just going to continue to grow. So it's a, it's a great time to get your foot in the door. Um, and uh, hopefully some of you might want to become product designers uh, uh, one day. I think with that, I'll uh, hand it back over to you, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing those little words of advice. I know those are very similar to the things that we tell students we work with, and I'm sure any of the teachers tuning in or the parents who are watching this have probably said those same things to their kids, but sometimes hearing it from someone else just makes a little bit of a difference. So thank you for joining us. And if anyone does have questions for Cameron, then please make sure and put them in the Q&A. So we are going to move on to our final panelist. Stephanie Zawada is a graduate from the University of Saskatchewan with a bachelor's in mathematical physics and a master's in physics, where she discovered her love for data analytics. She has now been at Chemical for the past three years, working as a business intelligence analyst with business technology services. At Chemical, Stephanie strives to foster data-driven decision-making by creating actionable dashboards and data models using machine learning and leading data workshops. She is also the co-founder of the Saskatoon Data Group, who aims to connect the data community in Saskatoon and provide professional development opportunities to data analysts, data scientists, and data engineers. So please welcome Stephanie. All right, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. Oh, there we are. Okay, I cannot share while well, she's sharing. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm Stephanie Zawada and I'm a business intelligence analyst, uh, which is just a fancy term for a data analyst. And I work at Chemical Corporation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit today about my career journey. So I graduated high school back in 2008, um, born and raised in PA and when I was younger, I was never someone that kind of knew what they wanted to do as a career when they were older. For me, it was something that changed every year, but I always loved math and science in school. So I always knew I was going to do something related to that. And especially I loved chemistry in high school. So um, when I graduated high school, I thought I'm gonna be a chemist. So I went to the U of S and in my first year, I took um, chemistry classes, of course, and I took like math and biology and some other stuff. And what surprised me at that time was I did not like chemistry at all. Um, I didn't do that well. I was just like, this is not for me. But what I did really enjoy in my first year were my math courses. So I decided, OK, I'm going to switch my major to math. And in my second year, I took a bunch more math courses. And this is also in my second year when I took um, my first year computer science and my first year physics courses. So then midway through my second year, I had a meeting with an academic advisor in math who asked me, hey, you're taking physics now, right? How are you enjoying your physics classes? Uh, so I said, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying them so far. It's good. And he said, you know, we have this mathematical physics program at the U of S. Uh, it's a great program. It's really interesting. And I really feel, feel like it would improve your career prospects after you finish your bachelor's. Uh, so if you're enjoying your physics classes, I would highly recommend you check out this program. So I thought, ah, sure, why not? You know, I'm enjoying physics. Let's give it a shot. So I went through the program and finished it. And I graduated in 2013 with my bachelor's in mathematical physics. And at that time, I was kind of like, okay, now what? During my time um, in my undergrad, I only took first year computer science. I didn't feel like I had a lot of marketable skills at that time. Um, you know, I did some summer research positions, but 
again, a lot of that was just like utilizing just really basic C++, which is all I learned in my first year computer science, which is MATLAB, things like that. So I really still had no idea what I wanted to do. So I did what a lot of students do in that position, I think, and they go to grad school. And so I went to grad school, also at the U of S, um, and I got my master's in physics, specializing in superconductivity, and I finished my master's in 2015. Now, when I first started my master's, I thought, okay, I'm going to be a researcher, like I love research, or maybe I want to be a professor, things like that, just continue in the world of academia. And then um, more towards the end of my master's, you know, when I defended my thesis, I said, nah, th this isn't for me. Let's try and apply for a few jobs throughout the city and just kind of see what happens. Uh, so I applied at a few places and I wasn't having much luck until one day I came across a job posting for a junior data analyst at Vendasta. Now reading through the job description, the first thing I thought was, I'm not qualified for this job. Um, they wanted good HTML and JavaScript skills. They wanted um, good SQL skills. They wanted good Python skills. And you know, up until that point, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of programming experience. It was really in my master's that I taught myself more how to program, but it was mostly, again, more advanced C++. I did teach myself Python um, a bit to do my plotting and stuff like that and to do some other basic data analysis. But at this point, I was mostly comfortable in C++. But I thought, okay, let's just take a shot anyway, just to apply, take a shot in the dark and see um, kind of what happens. Uh, so I did. And after I applied, I also started taking some online courses for HTML and JavaScript, just in case I got the call for an interview, uh, which I did a few days later. And at that point, you know, I started panic taking some SQL courses online as well. And I went in for my interview. And I had an HR style interview and a technical interview. And, you know, I thought it went okay. Um, I, I knew I wasn't going to be the most technically strong candidate, but I did my best. But what I tried to do to set myself apart was really show my enthusiasm for working at the company, just showing I was really passionate for working at Bendasta, and I really thought I would be a great fit for the team. And after my interview, I also actually like called Bendasta and followed up and said, you know, it was really great to meet you. I really feel like I would be a great fit on this team. And um, just a few hours after I called in, they, they gave me the job. So I was really happy I did that. Now, for those of you that don't know what Vendasta does, um, they develop digital solutions for small businesses to help them improve their online presence in essence. But the key is they don't sell directly to small businesses. They partner with agencies who then resell Vendasta's products to those small businesses. So in essence, a data analyst role is decision support. Um, you're basically helping people use data to make better company decisions. Now at Vendasta specifically, um, I use their data regarding their customers, so their small businesses and their partner agencies, and how they're using um, the, their products that Vendasta builds to help guide software development and help sales. You know, where are people getting stuck in this workflow, or are people buying um, this like product upgrade when they buy this other thing, if not why, kind of digging into stuff like that. Uh, when I was hired, we were a team of five, I think. Uh, we grew to a team of seven at one point. The team size kind of fluctuated, but it was a really great group of people. Um, on the left here, this is not the, the team of data analysts. This is just like a hodgepodge of people. Uh, when Vendasta won a business builder award, this is at the award ceremony. And a data analyst does involve quite a bit of communication as well. You know, you're trying to figure out what decisions people are trying to make with the data and what questions they're trying to answer. So you typically work directly with um, management and product managers. And then you take those requirements for the project, analyze the data, build data models, and deliver the data in a consumable way. If it's something that needs to be tracked over time, typically you'd build a dashboard. If it's just a one-off thing, maybe you just give a presentation. So at Vendasta, you know, some different technologies I worked with. Um, the Google Cloud Platform, they use um, GCP for their cloud computing needs. Me, as a data analyst, I used uh, Google BigQuery, which is their data warehouse a lot, which just involves writing a lot of SQL. Uh, we used Google Data Studio as a dashboarding tool, but also made custom dashboards using HTML and JavaScript and Python for different data pipelines and more complex data analyses, which were done typically in Jupyter Notebooks. 
Now, after about three years, I worked at Vendasta for about three and a half years. And after about three years, I started to feel like maybe I just wanted to get some different experience at a different company. Uh, so late 2018, I had applied at Cameco. I saw they had a data analyst or business intelligence analyst position open. So I applied and I got the job and I started there in 2019. Now, for those of you that don't know what Cameco does, we are the one of the largest global providers of the nuclear fuel products uh, used to generate power in clean energy nuclear reactors. So we basically mine, refine, and ship uranium all around the world. It's super cool. Now at Cameco, the basic role of a data analyst is pretty much the same, decision support. Of course, the data is different though. So I use Cameco's data regarding our mine operations, supply chain, logistics, and ongoing projects to help optimize our operations and save costs. Um, and that's typically what I like the best at Cameco. It's a really diverse role. I get to work with all of our different departments and a lot of different people. And I sort of get to see the enterprise like as a, as a whole more so than other people get to in the organization. So that's what I like the best. When I was hired, we were a really small team of two, and now we've grown to a team of five, a really excellent group of people again. Although on the on the left, again, this is not the data analyst, this is our just department Halloween costume a few years ago, we were jellyfish, as you might be able to tell. Again, a really communication heavy role. I work directly with management and project managers at corporate and also our Northern Mine sites and our sites in Ontario as well. Um, again, the day-to-day -day involves building data pipelines, analyzing data, creating data models, and delivering the data in a consumable way. Uh, the development is a little more full stack at Cameco. I do a little bit more of the data engineering side as well, building data pipelines, because of kind of as I mentioned here. And I am recently expanding my skills into machine learning as well, trying to break into the, the data science side of things. So at Cameco, we are an SAP shop. So I work quite a bit with SAP data but we also have a lot of uh, SQL servers. So I typically use SQL Server Management Studio quite a bit to write queries. And interestingly enough, we do also use the Google Cloud Platform for our cloud computing needs. And also again, BigQuery is our data warehouse, but for dashboarding and reporting, we use Microsoft Power BI. So that creates some interesting dynamics uh, with BigQuery. And then Python for data pipelines, uh, specifically Apache Airflow we're using recently and Google Vertex AI for machine learning. Uh, so just to kind of finish up here, um, around the time I left Vendasta, myself and a few folks at Vendasta wanted to not only keep in touch when I left, but also get to know the larger data community in Saskatoon as a whole. So we formed what we call today as the Saskatoon Data Group and started to host meetups in the city. Now, before COVID hit, we hosted three meetups and we had about 25 to 30 people come out to each meetup, which was awesome. And it was just a space for data professionals in the city to come out and just network with other people, talk about what they have going on at work in the form of just like casual conversations with, the, with someone else over a beer or presentations or panel discussions, things like that. Um, we really enjoyed hosting these meetups, um, unfortunately. COVID kind of got in the way of things. Um, and we tried to do the virtual thing for a while. We had some like YouTube live streams where we would interview folks or have virtual meetups, but it just wasn't quite the same. Um, so we hope to get back into this when uh, things are a little bit more back to normal. So watch for on uh, online if you see any postings about uh, data group meetups in the future. So just takeaways from my career journey. Uh, it's okay to be indecisive and figure out the right path as you go. I'm someone that's definitely a planner and likes to have everything figured out advance in advance of when I do something, which is not how my life worked at all. It's kind of interesting. Um, apply to jobs that interest you, even if you don't have all the right qualifications. Oftentimes you can just sort of like teach yourself the basics of a skill and then go into the interview and that's good enough to get you the position. And then you can just kind of learn on your own or just on the job to get more advanced in those skills. And also to kind of set yourself apart in interviews, just show that you're really passionate about the company and the position. And um, oftentimes, you know, that'll set you apart and you can get hired that way and take risks and say yes to new opportunities. So help plan that event, go to that networking thing, even if you might not really want to. Small things like that can open more and more doors for you. Um, myself, just planning meetups in the city, I got to meet a lot of new folks, which allowed me to plan a women in data science conference a couple of years ago that I'm pictured here on the left um, with my fellow conference organizers. And then I got to network with more folks there, which opened up more doors. So often it's just kind of like a, a snowball compounding effect for these things. So that's me. I'm Stephanie. Thank you so much. Stop sharing.
All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing that info. And I loved the little photos you had to give us a glimpse into your life and into your career. So at this point, I am going to invite all of our panelists to come back and join us. And I've been watching the Q&A and we have had um, a little bit of action going on in there. There's a few questions that have been answered um, just through um, the actual Q&A. So I might highlight some of those just so everyone joining us and especially those watching after the fact can hear. Um, so early on when Ellen was um, presenting, she talked about Computer Science 30. And so someone asked, is Computer Science 30 an elective or a required class in high school? So I'm going to pass that on to Aaron to answer as he had answered in the chat. But just for those who are um, watching after the fact so that they can hear what he had to say. Sure, I think that chat went to everybody. Uh, but uh, CS 20 and 30 are both electives, uh, but they count towards your science uh, portion of your high school um, curriculum. In, in most of the streams, there are some streams where they might not. So check with your student advisor on that. Um, you can also, uh, depending on your experience, you can sometimes test out of one of those uh, or take them early. Um, that's another thing to talk to a student advisor about. Awesome, thank you. And the one other question, sorry, Erin, I'm putting all the focus on you right now, but uh, just for anyone watching after, other than taking computer science classes, what suggestions do you have for students in high school interested in pursuing a career in tech? Yeah, so I don't, I don't even necessarily recommend taking computer science classes. Um, <laughs> you're gonna be able to cover off everything that you need to know in computer science through the excellent programming at a university or at Sask Poly. Uh, to, to be able to get uh, into whatever you need to professionally. Um, we are less interested in people who are laser focused on being a software developer um, in some ways and more interested in people with a broader range of experiences that they can bring to the table. Um, as you heard from Stephanie and Jennifer and Cameron, um, uh, all of their stories are circuitous. Uh, they, don't, they did not land on the job that they trained for initially. Um, they did not uh, find their way easily. And, and even once they landed in their jobs, the job changed underneath them. So they needed a breadth of experience to be able to uh, navigate that effectively. And we're increasingly seeing that. So people who know how to learn well, people know, who know how to communicate effectively, um, people who have a wide range of interests and, and the ability to become interested in things as they arise, uh, those are the people who tend to excel in tech careers. Uh, so use the time in high school to become uh, those Renaissance people uh, who are interested in many things and can uh, do many things. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, did anyone have anything they wanted to add to um, that question about what you can do early on to prepare yourself to pursue a career in tech? backing up what Aaron said there like yeah just you know I find the the most successful people aren't necessarily the best at that one given skill or something they're usually the person who's a bit of a, a generalist and has those different areas of experience to pull from so definitely in tech I think expanding your horizons and and gaining access to other classes and and interests and stuff is only going to help you yeah in your future career too. And working on communication skills as well. I think it was a few folks that mentioned, you know, oftentimes the most success, the, nah, the most successful people are the best communicators that can inspire and energize people around them. So working on your communication skills as well is super important for interviews and in your professional life. Ironic to stumble over that statement. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Cameron and Stephanie, for adding in. Um, we have a question. How has COVID impacted or changed the tech industry? Uh, first, I can answer writ ahead, large, yeah. but go ahead, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to pipe in the first thing that came to mind is that it's made folks more open to um, working from home, working remotely. So that sort of um, expanded the candidate pool, definitely, I think, for a lot of folks. At Cameco, before, I think we, we definitely heavily favored just 
local people um, and you didn't have a lot of flexibility in where you worked, you couldn't really like um, work at Cameco in Saskatoon, but like live in BC, for example. But now that's definitely opened up possibilities for that. And not just at Cameco, you know, other companies as well. Just the attitude toward flexible working arrangements and working remotely um, has really improved, which I think is an awesome thing. Yeah, that's certainly the key thing I would have highlighted. I, I would have added that there's actually a challenge now for our local companies um, in that we, uh, we used to be able to rely on developing and retaining a workforce in Saskatchewan. If we were going to invest here, uh, people would generally stay here. Uh, it was hard for them to uproot, but now uh, it is a national market here. Uh, we have large companies from Ontario and BC uh, based there who are now willing to hire people at Remote Forever and they're willing to pay. Uh, more. And so this is having an upwards pressure on salaries across the sector, uh, which is probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, for, for those of us who, who work, um, and, uh, and I don't know, Cameron, maybe you can answer this. Uh, when you were, when you moved to Calgary to work remotely, was there an adjustment for the change in cost of living for, in Calgary? Uh, no, there wasn't at the time, yeah. no. So it, it was actually, yeah, a, a Saskatchewan uh, based wage uh, while living in Calgary, which because Alberta hasn't quite figured out taxes yet, didn't actually hurt me too much. But uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't it wasn't online or it wasn't in line with um, Calgary wages for the same role, um, and it took COVID to kind of even that out. And now we're pretty much par, I would say. That's that's changing the other way as well. Uh, there are people from the Bay Area, for instance, who are saying, well, I want to move back home. The Bay Area is a crappy place to live and it costs me you know, twice what it would cost anywhere else in the world. And so I, I want to go back to Nebraska or I want to go back to Saskatoon and they get here and lo and behold, uh, the FANG company they're working for says, well, actually, now that you're living in a lower cost area, you're going to earn less money. And it's a, it's a startling uh, shock to them. Uh, but uh, we'll figure this one out. Uh, this one, this is not a solved problem. I think it's going to take us a decade for us to figure out what's what this is going to look like. But in the meantime, industries like Stephanie's, for instance, uh, you, uh, you actually have uh, people now no longer working underground. Um, sometimes uh, they're they're operating remote machinery from Mine Head as opposed to Mine Face, um, and that's increasing all the time. So that's going to be really interesting when somebody can operate uh, or, or teleoperate or, or monitor autonomous uh, equipment from a remote location. All right. and I would say COVID has only benefited uh, my working experience in terms of its, you know, what took probably years and years before, took about six months during COVID to figure out like remote meetings and uh, tech in terms of like muting people's mics and better connectivity <laughs> and stuff. So um, I would say COVID didn't change much in our tech industry other than making things a lot easier. And if anything, maybe speeding up some advancements um, and just the growth of the company now that we can kind of look anywhere and aren't so focused on just uh, Saskatoon or Saskatchewan as a whole. Yeah, I just want to echo what Cameron said, because if we were doing this event in person, we wouldn't be able to have him here with us. So I know even just the events that we host and we have students from across the province who are joining us, whereas we would host our events in person, which we do miss, but we were only able to work with the students in and around Saskatoon. So as horrible as times have been, there have been positives that have come out of it. And I think that we're seeing that in all industries. And like it was just mentioned um, in the tech industry, they're, they're um, not immune to that either. So there's one last question that we are going to address and then we will wrap things up. So this one was addressed to Aaron because I know he talked about hiring um, people in his role, but if anyone wants to answer as well, um, the question was, what do you look for when hiring employees in tech? Okay, maybe I'll start since I do a lot of hiring, um, uh, but I'd actually love to hear <laughs> across the sectors what, what people are looking for. Um, the, uh, 
we do start with a baseline uh, set of skills. And so usually it is a university degree, although a Saskatchewan Polytechnic uh, um, certification with uh, some experience behind it is certainly acceptable. We have several people who are very high performers in our organization who come from that background. Um, but uh, the fastest way is through, uh, um, without work experience, it's through a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Uh, probably one of those applied uh, programs would be fine, um, or an engineering degree. Um, that's kind of the baseline. But after that, we get to much more interesting stuff. Uh, communication is one of the top line items. And in my particular sector, that is the item. In fact, we're willing to teach technology skills. Um, and so specific technology skills don't really matter. The degree is there to indicate you know how to learn. Uh, not that you have learned something, because we're going to retrain you largely on on, on most of the things that that um, you think you know, uh, and and obviously you couldn't possibly know everything there is to know to apply to a whole bunch of jobs. So every company expects to train you, um, but communication skills are very hard to train. And so if you're unable to communicate effectively, uh, certainly orally, but in a written manner as well, uh, that's a real challenge. We prefer to refine that to teach current you know, email skills uh, that, or best practices that we have at our company. I uh, teach people how to do presentations in the style of our company. Uh, but if you don't uh, have a lot of confidence in that, um, then you tend to struggle a little bit to get hired in my particular roles. That role will be a little bit lower if you're a pure play developer. Um, uh, the, the top line item there will be problem solving skills. And so you will likely run a, a technical interview as a software developer that will run you through a series of questions for which there are a whole set of possible solutions, some of which are optimal, some of which are suboptimal, uh, but uh, it actually matters less what you answer and how you answer. So once again, communication plays a role in this one because we want to see you talk out loud as you go through these, uh, as you go through the problems and articulate the, um, uh, the process that you're going through to address the problem, stating your assumptions, figuring out uh, the path to a solution, uh, highlighting possible paths and discarding them, uh, those kinds of activities. And so uh, in the interview process, we encourage you to do this, but if you're not used to doing that or you've not practiced that in the context of doing that through schoolwork, uh, it's, it's a little difficult to suddenly take on. And once again, we're looking for people who are open about process because this is a team event. Uh, there's nothing that you do by yourself once you get in, into industry. And so your ability to work with other people is predicated on your ability to communicate with those people effectively about your thought processes um, so that you can be as efficient as possible. Um, so those are, um, I mean, some of the just very top line items, I, I guess. Uh, it, every company is going to be a little bit different. Uh, Jennifer, do you, when you're uh, doing grad students and, uh, and interns and, and summer students, what are you looking for? I was going to chime in because it, I'm a little bit of a different part of the spectrum. Most of the people that I'm actually looking to hire are undergrads or graduate students. People who are still working through their program, they're not finished yet. And what we're really looking for, again, as Aaron mentioned, is creativity, um, as Stephanie mentioned, enthusiasm, and a collaborative spirit. Um, a lot of the projects that we're looking to bring people on for are often new challenges. We're trying to maybe develop new software or new software, maybe not for the way it was intended because we have a new data type that, or a different type of analysis that we want to do that's a little bit off book. Um, and so a, a lot of creative, creativity and a willingness to collaborate with, um, you know, the people doing the bench work and other tech people in the building to try and you know, reach a solution to something, something. Um, so yeah, that collaborative spirit and perseverance. Weirdly in science, there's a lot of failure. A lot of things that you do don't work um, uh, and uh, people can have trouble with that. So um, it, it can be difficult to maintain that enthusiasm. Well, thank you, Erin and Jennifer, for answering that question for us. And thank you to our participants for asking questions. It always helps to um, add to our event 
to be able to answer the specific questions that you do have. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to thank our panelists one more time for joining us tonight and just say goodbye to all of them. Um, we enjoyed having you. It was great to hear from you and hear your stories. And I hope that their words of advice um, help some of you as you pursue your future career, whether it's in the tech industry or in any industry. So thank you to our panelists. I want to once again thank Ellen and the University of Saskatchewan Department of Computer Science for partnering with us to put on this event. We are very fortunate to have such great partners that we work with. I want to thank the school divisions that we are partners with, um, Greater Saskatoon Catholic School, Saskatoon Public Schools, Prairie Spirit School Division, and the Saskatoon Tribal Council for always supporting all of our endeavors. And thank you, whatever school division or whatever school you are part of, thank you for um, joining us today and taking part in our Spotlighting Careers event. I want to thank my colleagues who helped make our event possible. And I want to once again just thank everyone who tuned in and was part of our event with us. So on the screen, you will see a QR for some feedback. So at the SIEC, we love hearing from you. We want to know what you enjoyed, what we could do better in the future. And so please give us some feedback because we also really love to give out prizes. So give us some feedback and you could win um, a gift card. So let us know your thoughts. And if you are a teacher tuning in with your class, we also want to give you the opportunity to let us know um, what you thought of our event today and if there's anything that we could do differently in the future. And once again, scan the QR and you could win a gift card. So if you are interested in a career in tech, we do have some resources available on our website and I highly encourage you to go and check those out. We have our Spotlight on Tech video series where we interview different professionals from the tech industry. Um, and we have worked with a number of different companies and we've talked to people with very diverse roles. So go check out our Spotlight on Tech video series as well as our post-secondary video series, which highlights some of the um, programs across our province that deal with careers in the tech industry. So our website is always updating. We're always adding new information. And also this event um, is recorded. And as soon as we get it edited, it will be up on our web website as well. So you can check it out there. And if you are interested in exploring different careers, then each month we highlight a different sector. So in January, we will be looking at careers in business and finance. Um, and if you are interested in any of the months that have already passed, then we do record all of our events. All of our resources are on our website, so be sure to check it out and um, explore the careers that you may be interested in. And finally, the best way to stay up to date with everything we have going on, whether it's our spotlights, our boot camps, our summer program, um, follow us on social media and be sure to check our website out all the time as we are always updating it. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you at our events in the future. Oh, mm -hmm.